Boom. Welcome, everyone. As you can see, the smiling face on the other side is the internet banned, incredibly dangerous internet personality, Mr. Lyle McDonald. Yeah, and so um, I'm not really sure whose podcast this is, his or mine, but I'm, I'm doing the intro because I just opened my mouth first. But <laughs> we're, uh, we're going to talk about the maybe the compare and contrast of enhanced versus unenhanced training methodology styles and ideas. And that's the sum total of it. I think nutrition too, because I, I'm going to throw out a couple of ideas on that one that, well, let's wait till we get there. That you're either going to laugh or agree with me and we'll just find out. So fair enough. Where do you want to begin? Well, actually, so the last time, so, so we talked on the phone a couple weeks ago and threw out this idea. And I believe you stated, I hate natural bodybuilders. And I do genuinely think that the viewers and listeners would love to hear your, I'm sure, very calm, rational opinion to explain that statement. Um, fair enough. I... <laughs> I hate natural bodybuilders for a, literally almost every reason. Now, to be fair, let me backtrack and say that I once was one. Right. I literally you know, wasn't born chemically enhanced. And I did begin training at age 10. And I did not use drugs until age 16. Basic <laughs> math leads you to the conclusion that I trained for six years without drugs. However, that six years and the ensuing 35 have led me to the conclusion that Natural bodybuilding is horrifically boring, uneventful, unexciting, and the greatest example of it sucks hairy balls. It moves at the speed of fucking smell. The, the most gifted natural bodybuilder to me is about as impressive as, well, it's just not impressive. Um, and then lastly, and then on top of the whole, I'm not excited by it as a entity for reasons I do not understand Natural bodybuilders have just latched onto, in my at least opinion and experience, a couple of key fundamental things that is just kind of stupid, kind of dumb, kind of narrow minded. And again, just uneventful and unimaginative. And it just pisses me off. Why don't you tell us what you really think? Now, going back to so what you're telling me is that you don't think a ripped 165 pound male bodybuilder is impressive. How can you say that? Because with nominal drug use, they could be a ripped 200 pound bodybuilder. Right. I, I one of the things we when we talked about on the phone, and and for for the the folks listening to this who are old enough to remember the muscle magazines. Yeah. I want to say the early 90s or so. There was kind of a a, a big divide and a big backlash. The, the drug guys were even even then were starting to get you know, towards the bigger side, away from, you know, the classic physique and muscular development, which is one of the popular magazines decided, all right, we're going to jump on the all natural bandwagon. It became all natural muscular development. And that's pretty much what it has was guys that, you know, were a buck 65 in shape that almost looked like they lifted. And that, that went on for maybe a year or two. And as I think the magazine started to fail, they realized, you know what? fuck this, we're going to be all drugs, all boobs, muscular development. And they've never looked back. Absolutely. Uh, one funny story, I know I told you this. I spent a bunch of years in Salt Lake City, which I highly do not recommend. And I worked at this fantastic hardcore gym. And there's a, one of the bodybuilders I was talking to. And he was, he was shorter. I mean, he's a solid, you know, 220 contest shape. And, and we were talking and I'm like, you know, what, what made you choose to go on? I mean, I don't care either way. And he goes, well, I'd kind of hit the upper limits. He's like, I think he competed as, you know, the 196s, 190s, whatever that weight class is. He's like, I kind of reached, reached my limit as a natural and I wanted to be supernatural. And I just thought that was the best answer ever. And uh, I'll, carry, I'll carry that one just because I thought it was funny. Um, uh, so, you, so again, backing up. So you said something about you find that naturals kind of latch on to a couple of ideas. What, I do. Can you expand on that? Yeah, I, I certainly can. I, I think naturals and, and, and again, maybe I'm speaking, maybe not so much out of turn, but maybe I'm speaking from a naivety of not being natural. So I, I accept that when I say this, but they've latched onto this very bookkeeping like Einstein, Einstein, 
you know, loading a bar, extra rep, loading a bar, extra rep, and there's nothing else but this mechanical numerological advancement. There's almost zero nuance, right. almost zero intersection of art and science. It's just numbers. And admittedly, over time, you do get bigger as you get stronger. You do get stronger as you get bigger. Right. Yes, obviously, circa Mike Menser, whatever. Right. But the reality that it's this incredibly linear step-by-step -step approach, I just don't – not only do I not believe it, but I'll be more I'll – be, I'll be even more coy and say – I don't want to believe it. <laughs> Fair. Okay. Um, let's see where to start. So why don't we address your side of it, right? The enhanced okay. side. And I guess, I mean, not, I can't imagine we would need to qualify that, but obviously anything past, you know, ephedrine, creatine, whatever yeah. is going to, although actually this is really funny. You may remember this back during the all natural, when it was just becoming the fad, and that's really what it was. Huh? Uh, it was funny. Some of the, those little minor magazines that existed briefly and some of those minor federations, they started drawing stuff. Like I seem to recall one of them said that creatine was no longer natural because you were taking amounts that you couldn't get in food. At which point my training partner were like, well, by that logic, barbells aren't natural you should be going out and lifting fucking rocks and logs right obviously the weight room is unnatural whatever the hell that means anyway but like they got they were trying to just delineate it to such a fine point of it's like yeah i think you guys have kind of lost the plot here and gotten I agree. towards the towards the extreme um, well i can i can expound a little bit on drug enhance you know enhanced drug using training but the, the comedy of it is, it, I believe what drugs do, pe people throw out all sorts of language and they go, oh, it increases protein expression or area under curve, or they'll right. throw out some MPS, some kind of fucking alphabet soup nonsense. The way I see it for, the, for, for a workable definition that the average person could use and understand, basically drugs widen the parameters in every way, shape, and form. You can use lower reps or much higher reps. You can do fewer sets or many, many more sets. And the big one and the one that I think is most relevant, I do believe in normal natural physiology, which is where my education lives, there is a lower threshold for load. Using any amount of weights or reps or whatever below, and I don't know the number, but I'll, I'll throw out a number like say 50% of one RM. Right. is just meaningless. In the drug-enhanced world, that is not the case. Literally almost any load bears anabolic value. Right, because that's going to be my question. Well, it's, it's twofold. One, is there an optimal way to train on drugs? Like, if you look at pro bodybuilders, you will see guys from the Dorian Mike Menser school who basically <laughs> Even Dorian, I, I, it's so funny, you know, HIT wanted to claim him. Oh, he only right. one set to failure. Bullshit. Go watch his workouts. He does four pyramiding sets to right. one top set to failure. Correct. But he's doing way, he's not just going in and busting out one set because he got hurt enough as it was. But you've got those guys. You've got the volume guys who just do a lot of submaximal sets on a shorter rest period, kind of what Arnold mm -hmm. his ilk did. And everything mm -hmm. in between and as much as people get a hard on for, well, whoever the current Mr. O is, is how you, should, train. And you see that in every sport, right? Whoever, whoever's the top, their training is clearly what's optimal. It's like, but people have gotten to the top many different paths. Well, I number, have a, number, well, sorry, two questions. One, is there an optimal way to train on drugs from either a growth also safety is an issue, but no, hmm. but number two, if you're on enough drugs, does it even matter how you train? Well, one, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save this for a later part of the conversation, but I actually have a theory-ish, a concept, if not a theory, on why and how people train the way they train and whether they should or shouldn't. But to answer the actual relevant question you asked, which is, is there an optimal way? The answer to that is, I hate the word optimal. People use that all the time. They want to optimize their TRT or they want to optimize their... And it, it's as if 
you know, some grand creator has a setting called optimal and you're just turning dials looking for it. And eventually somebody will, you know, get the combination to the safe and they'll open the optimal, you know, chest. It doesn't fucking work that way. There's optimal for perhaps this aspect, this strength or optimal for, you know, this aspect of athletics or, and even then optimal is probably individualized to the person to the point in the moment in their career, their level of development on it, fucking on it, fucking on. So the reality is there's probably a slew of optimals for moments in time, but the reality is, again, look at the basin study, look at a number of studies. Training is the minor player in progress here. You You can take drugs in the absence of training and grow muscle. That was good. So this first, idea that training's the linchpin, right? The idea that training's the linchpin is asinine. asinine. That was gonna be my, that's gonna be my third question, actually. To that is, if you're on enough drugs, do you even have to train to make progress? No. To make you know exceptional progress, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, well, number one, uh, Mike Menser disagrees with you. Because if I, we send a man to the moon, Broderick, we can determine the optimal train. Someone in my Facebook group has been posting up some of the Menser's old stuff. And um, yeah, whatever. It's, I mean, it's, it's entertaining. It's certainly, he was never dull, but um, yeah, I guess so. Right. Acknowledging that the training is kind of the least of your concerns, right? And I, I, was, I was thinking about this earlier as we were coming up to this. Like if nothing else, I think for you know enhanced bodybuilders, and I don't know, I'd be interesting if the basin study looked at where regional muscle mass came up, right? It just looked at totals. Like, okay, well, do you need to actually do something, do at least a couple sets of curls to ensure that you know you get some growth? Probably to your point, to get exceptional results, to get symmetry, to get balance, to get the things. That, this is several years ago. I on a, a podcast I said you know, drugs make you grow without training. And some guy with very low literacy skills came into my group and he was like, well, they won't make you a a pro bodybuilder. And I, well, I didn't say that they would. Like, go look at what actually said versus no, they won't give you symmetry, shape, cuts, leanness, density, quality. But I didn't say they, but he couldn't get it. He just kept arguing the same point. Well, just taking drugs, well, blah, blah, blah. I go, I you should go somewhere. You need hooked on phonics is what he needed. That's what I tell right. everybody in that case. So yeah, I think absolutely. But within those parameters, right? So we know, like obviously Dorian was huge. And it's it's really interesting because he didn't start from much, right? He was like a little nope. skinny punk yep. chav. Whereas Menser, you look at him when he was like in his teens, he was already amazing. He, oh, just, I agree. he was just a bigger version of himself down the road. And you got those guys who, of course, Dorian, for what he did, he was hurt a lot, right? Ronnie Coleman, who was beast strong, is unfortunately in about as good a physical shape right now as a lot of those West Side guys. He's broken. But the point I would point out with Ronnie, and 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 I, I, I give Ronnie a bunch of shit because you know Ronnie's not particularly articulate, or you know yeah. he's not a wizard. He's not a lot of things. But he was almost certainly the greatest bodybuilder of all time. Yeah. And the thing about Ronnie Coleman is, you know, everybody loves to harangue on how strong he was. But the thing that I think they lose in that conversation is those feats of strength were in the midst of vast quantities of volume, vast quantities right. of volume. You know, right. Yes, he was doing 200 pound dumbbell presses, but he was doing them for 12 fucking repetitions. Got it. Yeah. Well, How yeah. strong would he have actually been had he taken the time to do a set of triples? Right. Yeah. True. That's I think lost when 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 people. This is something that maybe I should just throw out as a uh, a, a, a definition. When 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 I speak about you know, heavy or light, I am not talking about a number on the bar. Right. I am talking about a number of repetitions performed. If yeah. you can or only choose to perform five or less reps, I will define that as heavy. If you perform between six and 12 repetitions, I will define that as moderate. And if you do more than 13 reps, 
I will define that as light. Fair enough. That, that is the way I look at it. Yeah, and I wouldn't disagree with that at all. Um, okay. I guess I'm just thinking in terms of he was using pretty, I mean, there's that video of him partial squatting. What was it? Six, 700 pounds? Yeah. yeah. I guess the question is, could he have gotten as big as he was? And actually, one year coming back from the Arnold, he was on the plane taking up all the seats in one row, oh, yeah. first class. Like, it's hard for people, I think, to understand yeah. how big he really was. Agreed. Agreed. Without, like, he's big. You see him, but he's, he's standing next to big guys. When you see him in person, he yeah. looks like another species of human. He, he looks like he has just transcended humanity. Yeah. He looks uh, like the mind noble. It's just, it's mind boggling to even, and yeah. I can only imagine the guys now who are like 320, um, yeah. who are even bigger than he is. But could he have gotten that big well, without pushing the poundages up over so many years, which I think probably contributed to some of his joint issues? Well, here's, here's the thing. And I've had this conversation with, and, and, you know, and, and you're among, you know, in my mind, uh, um, among the tier of people I'm about to rattle off. But I've had this exact conversation with Mike and Ray Menser. I've had this conversation with Tom Platts. I've had this conversation with um, the, the owner of Muscular Development. Like, you know, oh, yeah. people like that. I've had this conversation. And here's what I believe. I believe the reality is on a physiological level, the answer is yes. They could have, all of these people, Arnold could have trained like Menser, Menser could have trained like Arnold, Yates like Haney, Haney like Yates. Sure. I think all of the, I think it's all interchangeable on a biological level. Okay. However, the emotional buy-in to be able to do it Absolutely. would be lacking by those people. Absolutely. Yates was a mean, mean son of a bitch. Getting him to train in a, quote, girly fashion would have yeah. been so repugnant to him Right. He would not have been able to do it. Right. And, and and conversely, you know, going back in time, getting Arnold to train, you know, to failure and throwing up would have been right. so appalling to him, he yeah. would not have been able to do it. Right. So I think there's a, a, a the one of the things as a biologist, I love to say this and I say it way too often, but the the, the beauty of the human species is not any one ability but the width and birth of our paltry abilities. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We don't do anything oh, yeah. particularly well, but Correct. we can do almost anything. That's our magic. And I believe we have so much adaptive capability that whether it's high load, low volume, low volume, you know, high volume, low load, or everything right. in the middle or some combination, we can make it work to our means. Right. As long as all the other factors are in place. You know, you say, you know, optimal. Now that's where things get weird. You, okay, this is the way you want to train. Now you must dose according to it. You must eat according to that dosing. Sure. You must rest according to that eating and dosing. And so there's the optimality comes from the concurrent layers. Right. Well, yeah. And what I would add to what you said is the one thing humans do better than any other species is this. We've got a brain and some people even use their brain sometimes. But if you actually compare us physiologically to just about any specialist species, we suck at everything. Agreed. That's the only thing humans are really is endurance running is we, we were able to run down some of, but like, you know, there's all those old jokes, like the average gorilla could outlift a human being. Like back, back in the day, I remember people were arguing that human beings were built to sprint. I go, dude, a house cat can out accelerate a human. Agreed. Right? Usain Bolt, uh, the, the top sprinters of the world would get beaten off the line by a house cat and a cheetah. They would like, no, we suck at sprinting. We're ter we yep. suck at swimming beyond suck. Um, yep. it, it's, you know, strength, power, explore, like we, we are, we do have brains and we do have this interacting system. I guess when I said optimal is, okay, we've got that pretty much let, just let the drugs do the work. You're going to need to train to get exceptional results. Make sure you get growth everywhere. And mm -hmm. I do need to tell you, I've got about my truly moronic pump theory of mm -hmm. growth that a buddy of mine who knows he's just thinks I'm so it, like, I don't, 
Whether or not I believe it depends on what day you ask me. People are going to listen to this and go, God, Lyle, stupid. Like, no, I don't, I don't completely believe this. It was just one of my ideas for like, why, why did pump training seem to work for Arnold and his ilk? But before I, you know, before I get to that, it's like, all right, we know volume works. And to your point, you do have to, something I tried to explain to someone years ago. And he was like, because at that, at that point in my career, I was much more of a lower volume, higher, hard gainer guy, I came from that philosophy. And I've, mm-hmm. I've, I've, I've gotten better since then. And he was like, all right, I'm going to take some of your ideas, but I'm going to combine it with Arnold's ideas. I go, look, no. What you need to realize is that a lot of systems will get you to the goal. But each system tends to be self-contained and internally consistent, mm-hmm. right? And you, what you mix and match at your own risk. I go, right, if you want to do a lot of volume, that's fine. It's going to have to be, you know, three or four sets from failure. Maybe you need to use short rest periods to make up, to accumulate some fatigue. Your mm-hmm. recovery patterns were, di- if you want to go, HIT or rest pause or dog crap type style training or some of Scott Abel's stuff for his advanced guys where you're rest pausing to 100 reps. I got news for you. You're not doing 20 sets per muscle group because it cannot physically be done. Each system is internally, if you're going to train three times a week, like HST or whatever, either if you want to do a lot of volume at each workout or even a moderate volume, you can't go to failure all the time because you'll burn out. (laughs) <laughs> or you have to go heavy, light, medium, which is fucking useless for bodybuilders anyway. Leave that to the football players. Dude, mm-hmm. seriously, bodybuilders just need to forget, unless it's some sort of daily undulating periods, that, and whatever. If you're going to go to absolute limits like dog crap, where it's failure and then rest pause, you maybe got two sets per muscle group every fifth day. And people forget that. They're like, look, you know, that's why those old muscle magazine articles like, I train intensely and with high volume. No, you don't, because it cannot fucking be done. It is, you cannot train to true limit failure for 20 sets of muscle. You got to pick one or the other. The question is, is one necessary? And to your point, psychology is a big part of it. A lot of people don't want to push that hard or hurt that much to do rest pause, that kind of grinding absolute failure. And I get that. A lot of people don't want to be in the gym for two hours and do, like you said, I believe Dan said, we shouldn't call it pansy training but let's just face it you've got hit which is manly training and you've got volume pump stuff which is you know derived i think it's what men's are called it probably yeah um i I, and and the the funny part is you know i i I personally have watched men's train and he only trained in the fashion in which he proposed when cameras were running the rest of the time he didn't do that but yeah I don't want to besmirch him as a human, but sure. that was the, that was the reality that I saw. He lost the plot so completely towards the end of his career. I think by the end of it, he was recommending one maximal isometric repetition every two weeks, and like it just it was to see how how extreme he could get from because you know we've talked about the original Arthur Jones HIT very rational, very reasonable. Yes. Nine true limit sets per week is enough. Yep, you know you. Or you could probably do 20 submaximal sets and probably make it up and the end result in the big picture, six, one, half dozen, the other, especially if you're enhanced. Yep. The, uh, you know, and it's funny, it's, it's, it's funny because drugs, the conversation of drugs and the HIT people never really comes up. But I am just weirdly uniquely positioned that I know an awful lot of those people. I right. have personally trained with Ellington Darden. Wow. I've had conversations with Ray, Mike and Ray Menser. By the way, Ray Menser was the actual embodiment of actual legitimate really? Jonesian high intensity uh, training. Ray it. Menser actually did that shit. Wow. L- okay. Literally. Not, and, and, and through his entire career, it wasn't a, a hap, you know, okay. happenstance um, yeah. But, you know, I, I, I know these people. And the thing that is funny is, you know, you, you talk to, um, you know, the, you know, I, 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 wanted, I wanted so deep, deeply not to bring up names. But, you for instance, um, you know, Mike Isretel and company will we'll talk about SRA curves or, you know, protein expression curves or those sorts of things. Once you start implementing exogenous pharmacology, infrequent training, becomes very very rational because 
the drugs are extending the, the, the SRA curve to such a degree, additional training doesn't really make a lot of sense. Right. And, and I've long felt that a lot of, I can't find it. I bought this silly book at Half Price Books years ago, a couple years ago, and hidden inside it, it was a mens mens mensor pamphlet called HIT for Women. It's awesome. It's, it's four pages of the same HIT workout he always gave, and he got a, fee a woman to write an introduction about why women, it's awesome. I just, I saw him like, this is way better than whatever other stupid book I just bought. But yeah, and I, I, I kind of felt it seemed like, you know, it, we, we tend to over uh, romanticize, you know, the golden age back in yeah. the, you know, the pre-drug era. And you, like you and I have talked about, drugs were in the game way earlier than people realized. Testosterone, Absolutely. it wasn't like, oh, it started in the seventies. I got news for you guys. Um, yeah. It was probably the 50s. They were at least dabbling with the early forms. But, you know, everybody then they trained pretty much three times a week, full body ish, moderate volumes, yeah. got stronger in that moderate rep range. Kind of what, and it seemed like when drugs really entered the picture in a big way in the 70s, yeah. that's when you saw a lot of the, you know, bomb and blast once a week type body yeah. part splits. Because to your point, it all kind of works. And it all yep. sort of doesn't matter. Yep. Um, yeah, I think, I think, especially the high frequency stuff, and I don't want to just shit on it because I, I really am, I'm just not interested in the argument one way or the other. But right. I think the problem with the high frequency stuff is it has a legitimate application in sports. Correct. In that, in sports, there is a skill aspect, whether that sport be Olympic lifting or even, you know, to get good at squatting for you know, sure, sure, sure. Or some other thing. Yes. There is a technique aspect and the, 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 the age old adage that he who practices the most tends to be the best. Right. The, the consistent application of doing the thing generates skill. The skill parlays into performance. But that's the thing is I believe, for instance, like using Olympic lifters, because I do love to shit on them because they're all co fucking cocks. Um, you, just universally, by the way, for all you Olympic lifters out there, fuck you. I, um, yeah. I, I, yeah, it's hard, hard to disagree with that. They, I they, believe it's an, it's an elitist. Get, pricks. It's an elitist. They get, they get, Go ahead. They get, they get big and strong, essentially, in my mind, in spite of their bad high frequency methodology. They right. must do the high frequency to be good at the movements, but doing the high frequency is not ideal for hypertrophy and strength accrual. Agreed. Is my point. Yeah, but, and they it's funny, the Chinese who are the most jacked of the Olympic lifters, they do bodybuilding shit after their after the, they do their Olympic lifting stuff, they squat, mm -hmm. and they go do eight sets of eight. Apparently, I know a guy that, that works with one of the uh, ex-Chinese coaches. It's like, yeah, they're high, their approach, here's their approach to hypertrophy. So scientific. They pick one or two exercises that they know works for them and they do eight sets of eight to 10 or until they get bored. And that's pretty sounds much. Suspiciously that like the, sounds suspiciously like the German volume 10 sets of 10 that's been around. It's just like, and of course we know they're all juice. They're all just like, yeah, just go put in some work, just yep. whatever movements you kind of like to do. And, and, but it's not, it's certainly not the Olympic lifting that's making them big, but yeah. And that's I agree true. body people, it's funny watching people impose those ideas on both bodybuilding, even with powerlifting. <laughs> one, of the, one of the funniest interviews is Kurt Karwoski, uh, an interview, and somebody asked him, what do you think about this high frequency training? And he just said, nobody's lifted more than us. Yeah. Because in the big picture, and the power, any power was listening to this, I will be very careful to qualify my statements because they get, they get real, real itchy when I say stuff like this. In the big picture, compared to sprinting, diving, swimming, gymnastics, bench press is not a technically difficult movement. Now, yeah, if you're, if you're four ply shirted, absolutely. Like, do you? I don't get me wrong. Is there a technique to it? Sure, but you can teach the teach the average gym rat how to be a pretty decent bencher in like a month, and it'll take you a fucking decade to get an Olympic lifter to be able to snatch consistently. Like it Agreed. is. Now, do I think squatting once a week is optimal? No, I think there's a practice component up to a point, but 
The simple fact is that powerlifting, I've got a half written article. It is an exception to every other sport that's out there. No sprinter would sprint all out once a week and expect to get anywhere. No other athlete would do that. And in powerlifting, it is the one fucking activity. Well, I'll say in also that includes bodybuilding, but then we, we're not going to have the argument over is bodybuilding a sport because that'll really piss some people off. Uh, it short answer, no, it's a beauty contest. Long it's answer. Pageant. It's it, pageant. It, it, it's the only activity I know where what 90-90% of your training is has nothing to do with your competition. Yep. You cannot name another activity like that. Yep. Go, but, but posing, dude, it takes, you can teach a monkey to pose in six weeks. It's one, it's 0.1% of your overall package. A little, a little disjointed, but I just thought of something really, I think is funny and relevant to the conversation. I, I did a podcast with a good friend of mine um, who, who happens to be an engineer. And we mm. often talk about the mechanics of things. Right. And, we were talking about the frequency versus high frequency versus low frequency. And I pointed out that androgens are a major player in motor learning. They actually allow you to learn technical skills faster to the right. point where back in the GDR days, they were giving androgens to ice skaters and gymnasts. Oh, yeah. Everybody they really didn't need additional muscle. They just wanted the, the, the neurological motor learning function. So anyway, the, the, it, I tend to be the language guy and I tend to say quippy, you know, linguistic things. And I said, so, you know, enhanced athletes have a motor learning advantage or the converse of that would be, uh, unfortunately, naturals have a learning disability. <laughs> oh my. Oh so, my, that's funny as hell. I thought it was, but uh, again, yeah. I've thrown some ire. Yeah, fair enough. But what I was also going to say, this is a while back, you know, for about a month, high frequency bodybuilding was super faddish on YouTube because people had ebooks mm -hmm. to sell. And of course, me being me, I did a, a, a pissy little thing about the real reason this, because the research doesn't support it whatsoever, despite all these theories about and muscle protein synthesis rates and durations and all this other shit. Because people forget that, yes, muscle protein synthesis is part of it, but there are way more systems than that that are adapting over muscle protein breakdown, capillaries, mitochondria, and whatever, whatever. And and this guy who got pissy with me, I won't name, was like, well, you know, it's it's you, you have to keep the movements grooved. I go, dude, if you need to groove a barbell curl every fucking day, you are what my coach used to call a motor moron and you need to pick a different sport. Yeah, Agreed. you know what? When I used to when I was when I was younger, if I only squatted once a week, because I was apparently I was a motor moron. I actually had my testosterone was low. I would forget how to do it. Every Monday it was like relearning. But if I put in a light front squat day on Friday, I would be fine. But it's like for the most bodybuilding movements, I'm sorry, how much practice do you need on a pec deck? <laughs> for fuck's sake, this is not an argument that you're gonna make to me that I'm gonna buy about high frequency for bodybuilding. And, you know, you, you brought up uh, Kirk Karwaski, and, and I think that's a perfect example. You, know, you look at Ed Cohn, Kirk Karwaski, um, even Kazmaier, the literally the gold standards of right. powerlifting, eternal. Yeah. They, they were historically one body part per week, just very, very – Cohn, you could consider I – mean, crossover because he squatted on one day and deadlifted on another right. and he had a very similar technique in each yes. his squat was deadlift like and his deadlift was squat like yeah. i accept that but even still yeah. by the numbers he squatted once per week and he was the best that has ever walked this fucking earth agreed agreed um yeah i like you know yes and that's it, getting way off topic and i want to come back to my dumb pump theory because i want you to shit Please. all over because it's just funny. It's just one of my dumbass ideas. Um, even with all this new technology, and I know I could get you bitching about shitting on West Side for the next three hours, and maybe that's a that's a whole separate podcast. We could just agree on West Side. Uh. For but all this technology, and we're just like, oh yeah, and fucking bands and chains and frequency and this, and that, and the other. And it's like, all right, outside of gear, outside of the geared powerlifting, where people are now benching over a thousand pounds, but because yeah, it's not the shirt doing it whatsoever. That's why absolutely it's not the shirt. 
even the guy uh, whose name I forgot completely, who's squatted over a thousand raw, motherfucker, he's 400 pounds, right? right. He is a giant among men. Is not to denigrate the lift. It no. is the all time greatest lifts of all time. But he had like, but yeah, outside of geared lifting, have the records in raw power lifting really improved? And the answer is there are there are more outliers because there's more people entering. I believe Greg Knuckles did in one of his tedious analyses of this, where he goes, look, the average, the average result in powerlifting, despite 20 years of Louis Simmons, change, bands, conjugate, board, this, that, the other, the average results have not changed. There Correct. are occasional extreme outliers because we're getting some freak shows. Yep. But the new, whether you squat two or three times a week, that will be up to your individual. And, and then and this is, uh, you know, again, a whole nother shitstorm. But if also if you look at the um, relaxation of the implementation of the rule book, mm. it's arguable that powerlifting is actually worse than it was 20 or 30 years ago. True enough, except maybe USAPL, but they keep having lifters get popped for drugs. So they yeah. are the they are they are the nightmare of the you sport. Know, there are guys out there, you know, to your point, you know, Maddox and some of these guys that are benching you know, well over 700 pounds raw now. But sure. again, they are you know 400 plus pound human beings. Again, right. doesn't doesn't negate the thing. It Absolutely. just. But if you yeah, if you draw a, if you draw a line in terms of what super heavy weights you know historically did. It's, it's really not aberrant. It's just the next progression of, sure, people are now big enough and can take enough drugs to do that. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, so all this stuff, and like, don't get me wrong, like the power lifter I train, she does a high frequency, but honestly, she is a bit of a motor moron. Like yep. this is not like, it is, it is specific to her because I've trained her, I've known her over eight or 10 years. A, she doesn't handle high reps. And B, if she doesn't squat every two days, she truly fucking forgets how to do it. I actually have a question for you very specifically because I know you are just a research animal mm-hmm. and you catalog shit in your head. Mm. Years ago, I remember coming across a paper that I have since lost and not been able to refine that suggested that detraining was proportional to frequency, meaning the less frequently you trained, the longer you ret- retained qualities, and the more frequently you trained, the faster you lost qualities. Hmm. Does that does that ring a bell? It doesn't because I tend to a lot of the time a lot of that motor learning stuff, like detraining literature. Just I don't know. I never really paid that much attention to it, but it wouldn't surprise me although i have to i I would question what's causality is it that the training the high frequency is what causes you to lose it faster or is it the people who need to train more frequently like i don't know i'd have to go look it up like and that gets into a separate thing let me let me put a pin in that fair enough it's a question that's that has come up all right maybe this applies to enhanced users but certainly naturals everybody has those stubborn body parts that just Mm -hmm. don't want to grow as well for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And it always seemed that the muscle group that was hardest to grow when you were gaining was the muscle that lost the quickest when you were dieting. Presumably for the same reasons, because physiologically, whatever made it more difficult to grow made it way easier to break down. Agreed. Okay, so it, it could be something, you know, motor, and God, motor learning research, it's hilarious watching people have applied this. They're like, we had someone move a cursor around with a thumb, and if they did it this way versus this, like, I don't fucking care. Yeah. Study a squat and see what helps improve squat mechanics faster. Um, right. But yeah, like all the frequency stuff, like, it's fine. But, you know, the guys like, I like, really like Matt Gary. Did you know we had a U.S. powerlifting team? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I didn't either till about a year ago, but apparently we do. And apparently Matt Gary is the coach and, and I like him a lot. I've heard, listened to a lot of his stuff and he's like, yeah, you know, we squat, men squat two to three times a week, bench three to four times a week, deadlift one or two times a week, women add one. And I'm like, well, that's fine. I don't have a problem with practicing the skill of it, but to your point, has natural, have natural, have overall natural results really improved with all of this new technology? No, no. Simmons was optimizing for the gear and, and did it very well. But, you know, what, what was Simmons' old idea? If you want to improve your bench, get a better shirt. Yeah, ba- basically. And that's and, what it comes down to. 
and and again, you know, I, I shit on Westside pretty you know consistently, but I will give them credit where it's due. And that what it what it was is the the training was a re- revolved around addressing the muscular deficiencies of the shirt. The yes. shirt broke the bar off your chest, and then oh, your right. front delts and triceps needed to engage. Absolutely. So you had hyper strong triceps to match the pressing power of the shirt. Right. I do also think, and it's funny because I like, you know, everything comes full circle and a lot of Louis's, uh, what he was sort of railing against, right? The old classic linear periodization, four weeks at 15s and four weeks at 12 and eight and five and three. And it was dumb shit invented by Mike Stone in the seventies because he read a bunch of Russian shit that he didn't understand is that Louis got people well, I don't think you should max year round. Uh, how he got that, I've read those Russian manuals and some awful crap it is. But how he got from mm-hmm. that to we max year round uh, is beyond me. But I'm told that current kind of prime, like modern powerlifting, the guys do at least a little bit in that 85 to 90% range year round. Like they're not maxing out. But everybody learned the fucking hard way. When you do 15s for a month, you lose your top end. And by the time you get back there, you're maybe not even really that much. Even Cone, who started with that, later in his mm-hmm. career, was like squat, bench, deadlift, he never went above five. The mm-hmm. other shit, he cycled 15, 12, 10, 8, or whatever. So yep. I do think it's interesting that, like, I think that sort of, but it, and, and it was like, oh, but Simmons was a weak point system. Um, the only system I can remember that wasn't was Corte three by three. And it was just, it was just nice and goofy and symmetrical, but like did power lifters get away from training their weak points ever? I, not that I'm aware of. The only guy I could think of, and, and to be fair, the only guy I could think of and to talk about a fucking outlier was Mark Chalet, who literally just squat benched a deadlift and did nothing else. Like literally nothing but, else. Well, I, I have a buddy who's been in powerlifting for years and, and his, he, he and a buddy of his developed what, what I think is actually sums it up, which was the better built you are for an exercise, the less assistance movements you need to do for it. And I think that yeah, pretty absolutely. much, right, that alone, that, inco- that tells you everything you need to know about training for sport. Yep. Is, I, I, am, I am the embodiment of that. I, I can high bar squat, 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 squat and squat and squat some more. And if you're not built to bench, you're going to have to do a shit ton of tricep. Right. And extra work. Right. And I think that's I literally I literally can high bar squat and nothing else. Like this whole like do do squats build your hamstrings. There are months on end when I don't even fucking do a hamstring exercise. Yeah. I will do six or eight sets of high bar squats and fucking leave the gym whistling. Yep. And yep, same here. I absolutely agree with you. The more predisposed you are to an exercise, the less relevant anything else becomes. Right. And how we got onto this a typical conversation, how we got into talking about powerlifting theory from body. Oh, it's a high frequency thing in practice. And let's face it, bodybuilding, if you, ha- if you are having to groove a tricep extension daily, you go pick a simpler sport, go play video games because e-commerce or e-gaming, you might actually make some money. Um, it's not sport and trying to apply even that, that Norwegian frequency program that I <laughs> got such a hard on for. And it was like, well, number one, if you actually look at it, the average, because everyone was like, ah, oh, see, Bulgarian in frequency and this and they're like, no, the average intensity was like 75% over the yep. week. They had one heavy day. They had a bunch of fucking practice days. About yep. half the guys got better improvements. About half the guys didn't. Even the guys who grew a little bit better, the coach of that program, the guy that designed it was like, if I were to design hyper, a pure hypertrophy program, I would train maybe twice a week per muscle yep. group with a higher yep. volume. Yep. Because I think that's the other issue with the high frequency for bodybuilding is again, like we talked about, you've got that frequency, intensity, volume interaction. Yep. If you're going to do high frequency, okay, how many sets per muscle group are going to do per, per day? Unless they're all totally, you know, total pansy sets. Like, okay, so you do three sets five times a week. Is three sets, e- unless they're limit sets, are is three sets even enough to stimulate growth? Especially in a natural. There is going to be, now the per workout volume is so fucking low. What's mm-hmm. the point? right? Training yep. three sets, five, you, you'd be better off doing five sets three times a week or eight sets twice a week and actually making each workout an actual stimulus. Right. So anyway, that, yeah, the high-frequency thing was, was ludicrous. Although wasn't, God, maybe this was Dante back in his old newsletter days. 
somebody recommended if you had like a weak muscle group, train it every day for a month. You remember this? Uh huh. And then I, I remember. I remember I, Arnold actually. I, I some okay. I, some odd thing Arnold mentioned about keeping a dumbbell under his bed and literally every morning waking up and doing rear delt raises off the edge of his bed. Okay. Um, you know, two sets each side every single day, and that was right. his solution to that problem. Um, yeah. Also, a weird kind of related, not related. One of the probably the only West Side powerlifter worth mentioning was Chuck Vogapool. And Chuck Vogapool was notorious for beginning every single workout. And he literally did like eight to 12 workouts per week, beginning wow. every single workout with five sets of wide grip chins. Right. Perhaps not a coincidence that he looked like a fucking hang glider. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. And, I, you know, that is, there's probably, well, it's funny. I think back to when I was in high school and knew even less than I knew now, if that's hard. If you, and like, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. So whenever I went into the gym and shitty old eighties weight room, I would do sets of chins, you know, one under grip, one medium, one wide grip, just as many as I could do every time I went in. And it's probably the best I've ever been at those movements in my life. Um, but yeah, but again, we're looking at West Side. We've got supposedly the way West Side worked is they brought their guys in, gave them the drug protocol they used, bumped their volume until they got sick, and then cut it back by 10%. And that was talk about maximal recoverable volume based yeah. on, you know, it's like that is the most you can do without overtraining given the drug protocol. So yeah, I think it's probably, but we you do run into all sorts of other problems. Okay my dumb pump theory, and then we'll flip it and talk about how what you talked about with enhanced training yep. might differ from natural. And I know you have some strongly held opinions on some of the shit naturals believe. Probably some of the shit I believe. Okay. I've seen nothing super convincing that the pump in and of itself is important for growth. Now, let me qualify I that. Agree. Remember I agree. No, I agree. Somebody, and I forget it was, you know, because a lot of it is like, oh, the cellular vol volumization thing that was super popular in the 90s. And Hossinger's old paper. And I'm like, look, you are taking, they're taking cells and exposing it to hypertonic fluids and getting 24 cells. This is like those quail stretching studies. Does it, does causing that, the cell to swell for five or 10 minutes, you know, whatever, I'm not. Convinced. And now I mentioned that to somebody who is also deals with enhanced athletes and they go, look, I agree with you for naturals. However, <laughs> when you've got certain things that we know are increasing the water content of cells, now we're dealing, and I, you know, and I said, you know what? I don't disagree with you. Yep. We're dealing with completely different systems. I agree. That so here's my theory, right? Okay. Why, why did Arnold and that ilk, why did what seems to be, you know, again, by the bias of getting stronger to get bigger. How did pump training work? And here's my dumbass theory. <laughs> Is that if you've got your bloodstream swirling with anabolic steroids, mm -hmm. that pumping blood into the muscle would keep the steroid near the receptor longer to get a better growth response. <laughs> That's my dumbass theory. The, the, you, you know, the, the funny part is Dan Duchesne actually said something very, very similar to that. I probably that, stole it from him. <laughs> Dan Duchesne said something very similar to that in that um, what, what comically, I believe, ultimately wound up being the mechanism behind blood flow restriction training mm. that some of it, it appears, and Dan, I don't know how he knew this because he. this is way before the science of this existed. He was of the belief that metabolic waste products built up within a region somehow made that muscle more sensitive to whatever right. anabolic compounds were in play. Meaning okay. the greater, maybe it was a pH change, maybe it was a blood flow, maybe it was like local growth factors. Right. But I nonetheless, that. he believed that the act of training a muscle made it momentarily more receptive to the actions of anabolic steroids. Right. I believe that he is correct. And I believe that that is why we see anabolic steroids make, let's say, runners more muscular 
where there's essentially no weight training and there's the utter antithesis of right. weight training. Get yeah. their fucking legs grow. How does that work? Clearly some other mechanism. Right. Yeah, I think so. I, I mentioned that to a, a buddy of mine who knows a lot and he, he thought it was, he's like, look, when you look at the concentration of steroids compared to the number of androgen receptors, they are already fully saturated. And which is sort of separate, what you and what you're now talking about, you're getting into different issues is lactate, yep. whatever, hydrogen ions, acidosis, yep. whatever. We know now that training probably upregulates the androgen receptor, upregulates ribosome activity, all this other shit that's going on that it, it seemed that, because there's actually a paper just came out, a very, a very hypothesis paper, you know, does the pump have a role in bodybuilding? And every paper was like, let's see, there were a couple with rat mammary cells, which I find very, very fucking useful. One was creatine, a rat creatine study and rats are not humans. And, you know, the old Hossinger papers, which were all in vitro work. And I'm like, look, I'm not saying that it's not. However, I've seen nothing convincing that it plays a role in naturals. But I think when we're dealing with enhanced athletes, you are dealing with a very different system. And I know Dan, I remember once he wrote, he said, look, too many strength coaches are trying to be bodybuilding coaches. He goes, look, I would rather get big without getting strong because getting strong is what gets you hurt. 100%. And he said, I'm a growth factor guy. He said, I think if you can increase mechano growth factor, fibroglass growth, fibroblast growth factor, IGF maybe he's like I think that if you can do that with enough of the tent you know with a sufficient tension stimulus like you said right early on broadens the parameters you can suddenly and this is going to lead into the natural thing is you can get away with a lot more because you're still almost anything you do sends a stimulus and when you add the anabolics in they're kind of going to make you grow them. I mean, there are stories of top guys that go in and seriously fool around with light weights. And yes. or, or the, what is it? There's a famous, the famous picture is like Lavrone pre yeah. when he's on versus, and like when he comes off, he doesn't look like he trains. Like he, he seriously deflates when yes. like it's, it's really mind boggling. And he's just one of those and, uh, anabolic hyper responders. Um, mm -hmm. uh, now I do. It, it's interesting that I will. I will caveat one thing we've said, and I do believe this. And it's one of the least scientifically backed things, but I just believe it as an observation. There does appear, especially in the world of drug use, there so, does seem to be a difference in retention from training style. The low load, high metabolic guys can get enormous. But when they relent yeah. training, they deflate at a much greater rate than the people that train at higher loads. Even right. if their body weights are equal and all these other things, there does seem to be a level of permanence yes. associated with higher loads. Now, and does that really have any relevance to, to competing? No, but it is interesting. Right. And that's, and it's funny to have watched, you know, you go back, look back at sort of those early German things and they're like, all right, we've got actual muscle fiber growth, myofibrillar growth, then we've got mm -hmm. sarcoplasmic growth. And they were always mm -hmm. like heavy sets, functional hypertrophy, all that rushy, rusky shit, you know, mm -hmm. non-functional hypertrophy, which is like, which for an athlete matters, right? Yes. Just being big for, if being bigger doesn't make you stronger, more powerful, or decreases your strength, your power to weight ratio, that has made you a worse athlete. So they talk, and then Agreed. that was a thing for a while. And then for a bunch of years, everybody shit all over it. And we're like, nope, if you look at studies, training turns on both myofibrillar and sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. And now we've gone full circle because mm -hmm. the new research is finding that, and actually this is the study by Cody Hahn et al that Mike Isertel uh, was part of. And they did, you know, worked up to 32 sets a week, four reps in reserve, fairly submaximal. When they went and analyzed it, it was sarcoplasmic hyper. So we've now come a full circle. <laughs> and, and it turns out we know why. The studies showing that training turned on both were an untrained. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Studies showing that there is a distinction between training styles and which is turned on, trained. Agreed. So, which because of course it is, and you know, then that was one of those ideas for the longest time. Because back in the day, West Coast bodybuilders trained for the pump. 
East Coast bodybuilders because they were a bunch of asshat New Yorkers, bunch of, yep. like you said, with New Jersey, Jersey. they were too fucking mean to train like that. And they wanted to go in like Dr. Ken and all those guys. And there were a lot of people be like, yeah, if the pumpers miss training for a couple of weeks, they shrink. And yep. the guys who train, and there used to be some talk about muscle density, muscle quality that the guys who went, and, and I do think it ties into this. I do think it is a myofibrillar versus a star. Now, yeah, to your point, if you're just looking to compete, big is big. Yep. Who gives a fuck, right? Well, it's and on top of that, again, living in my world, <clears throat> there's sure. pharmacological interventions that can give you that textural appearance right. that you don't get from training. <clears throat> Correct. Yeah. The application of specific androgens at specific times can literally change the, the sure. presentation of a physique in a way that training has no, no impact on whatsoever. Well, I said there's a paper I saw, I think a year ago when I was looking into this and it was because, you know, they measure, they use ultrasound and it's, it may be fluid shifts. It's hard to tell what's actually growing and they trained them for some amount of time and then they detrained them and remeasured them every day for a week. And after a week, they had lost every bit of supposed size they gained. One week, they went right back to baseline, yep. which tells you that it was all fluid because you cannot lose muscle mass that quickly. Agreed. Physiologically, you cannot. Right. So yeah, I think absolutely. But you know, to your point, if you're an athlete, it matters. Yep. If you're a performance athlete, right? And it matters. You don't just want to be big for the sake. Maybe if you're, you know, whatever, football. There, but even then, just having a bunch of fluid size. Doesn't matter. If you're going out to the bar on Friday, who gives a fuck? Go get your pump on. Nobody gives a shit. If yep. you're a bodybuilder, big is big on stage. Well, the funny thing, and I've actually kept this to myself because, again, it would just draw the ire of pretty much everyone, but I'll blurt it out here since we're in the, in the weeds. Yes. I actually think that the Jonesian method, the original real Jonesian yeah. method, full body, 10 to 12 sets, you know, every third or fourth day right. kind of thing, that legitimate, um, you know, Nautilus training bulletin kind of thing. I actually believe, now I'm going to say something and then I have to qualify it. Yeah. I actually think it's potentially the best method of training for athletes. And when I say the best, don't misunderstand. I don't mean like, oh, it's the most growth promoting, most you know, amazing. no. But when you look at the needs of an athlete, one of the major needs of an athlete is the weight training can't be interference in their actual fucking sport. Right. Because legitimate machine-based high-intensity training is so truncated, yeah. it is the least interferent yes. in what they're trying to do. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Um because that's Which what is people, comical because it's it's literally just nothing. No one says that out loud. No one even acknowledges that. But if you want to make someone a little bigger and a little stronger without fucking wrecking their ability to play tennis or golf or whatever yeah, a sport, yes, almost exactly what you would want to do. Yeah, absolutely. And that's people forget that. And it's usually and again, this is when strength coaching became a field, right? The NSCA in the seventies, and of course, it was a bunch of ex Olympic lifters who brought right. the oh, bias. Right. right. The NSCA, and I was, you know, I was certified by them at one point. Hilarious, because in their mind, I call it the three P's of training, periodization, plyometrics and power cleans. Every motherfucker, even for even for their personal training side, they re really I'm going to teach power cleans to someone. At, at, oh, you have got to be kidding me. But that was their bias. And that's where all the percentage based intensity work and all this other shit. And it's like, look, we're dealing with athletes. They have to practice their sport, whether it's skills training, sports training, metabolic training, five or six days a week. How much fucking weight training can you do on top of that? And the answer is, unless it's off season and fine, American football where you got to be a big brick wall. Sure. Do your weight training in your off season. But as soon as you get into two a day scrimmaging, I get, I got news for you. You are not spending four hours a week in the weight room. You do not, the whole thing when Godwin Westside took over and they're like, you should have an elite total as a football player. Why? Right. That's like Chad Waterbury. You should have a tr three times body weight deadlift as a mixed martial art. Are you fucking joking? Why? Fedor, I bet Fedor couldn't even do a deadlift and he was the deadliest man in the sport. Right. Probably didn't have a, probably didn't have a body weight bench press. And yeah, he was exactly. the baddest on the planet. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, that whole, that whole, so that whole thing, I agree with you completely. 
Now, I, I do want to, you, you mentioned the word that I was waiting for, and I, and I want to talk about it real quick. And it's, this is the, you know, on the <clears throat> enhanced side of things, there's a, a strict delineation, and I'll try to explain why. Yeah. You mentioned periodization. Mm. Um, and as you know, Mike Isretel is a good friend of mine, and he yeah. named his company after periodization. Right. And he and I do not see eye to eye on this particular <laughs> aspect of periodization. Okay. I believe that periodization is an artifact of drug use. Oh, absolutely. I do not believe periodization was created from biological concepts of, you know, hand cellier and, whoa, this makes, I believe that people applied drugs to athletes and realized that there was a linear escalation, more drugs, more abilities, more training, more drugs, more abilities, more training. And so periodization became an emergent artifact of drug use. Absolutely. Okay, that's my premise. Right. And because I agree, of that, I agree completely. I very much do promote periodization in my methodologies, but it is because, as you said, all things must be coherently right. aggregated, and it is a self-coherent system. The attitude is we will do a 16-week drug course, right. and the dosage will escalate relatively smoothly over that time, so your ability to tolerate and recover from greater and greater volumes increases with dosage. So it makes sense that the amount of volume you are doing should right. increase linearly. So over 16 weeks, you have an escalation of volume, an escalation of milligrams, an escalation of calories culminating in a fucking peak. In right. my, just to refine it, in my particular way of doing it, and I'm not saying that I'm more or less right than anyone else, but the way I do it is I would take 80 weekly working sets as the week one. Now, and that, I would is, that, is, that per, is that per muscle group or for per that, body? That is, that is in absolute. That is okay. at the okay. top of that week, there is an 80. And then okay. you may distribute it as you choose, okay. whether it's one day a week, two days a week, three days a week, or seven days a week. You have 80 sets in which to disperse in that week, okay. period. And I escalate from 80 to 120-ish right, over the course of 16 weeks. That's okay. it. It's pretty gradual. That's it. Yeah. I, the reason, there's a number of reasons for that. But here's the here's the the, the 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 incredible childlike logic that I apply to that. Volume, as you earlier said, is ultimately, in my mind, an equation. It's weight on a bar times reps times sets. That yeah. is what I define as volume. In my opinion, most naturals basically limit themselves to one third of the equation, which is yeah. weight on the bar. That's the only real thing they address. They say, I will do three sets, I will do 10 reps, and the only thing I'm modulating is load. Right. I take it the other direction. I, relatively speaking, fix the load and incrementally right. add repetitions and sets because if you look at it from this point of view and you say, all right, I'm going to go from uh, 100 kilos for 10 reps to 100 kilos for 11 reps, that's a 10% increase. Right. But look at moving from 100 kilos to 110 kilos. Sure. You, you could actually go down in repetitions. My premise is that the numerical side, the non-load side, is much easier to accumulate and also probably less dangerous and you know, ri risky. So that is literally the whole sum total of why I do it the way I do and I think, well, going back to the original thing, I agree. People, people are like, oh, that three-one cycle, right? The monthly three-one, ramp up three weeks, then one week off. And you go, well, historically, do y'all know where that came from? And they go, no. I go, well, for the Russians, it's because the kids wanted to go home one week out of the month. So they would beat on them for three and then they would go home. And the Germans were dosing the oral Toronto ball three weeks on, one week off. They were, and same thing, I think, with the with the the larger cycles. They used heavier androgens in the off season. They did a shit ton, just a fuck ton of volume. But as they were moving into their peaking and needed to pass the drug tests, they needed to move to shorter acting, anabolics, had to make by, you know, for performance sports. And that sort of became the norm 
And then the people forget that, and obviously, and absolutely the increasing volumes, you know, you didn't see the three times per day training until the Russians really took over in the seventies. You were full-time athletes drugged out of their mind, full recovery. It still broke most of them. Yep. Whereas Americans who didn't have that were still not training nearly that much. And as much as people have a fucking hard on for the Russians and the Germans, go look at the medal count guys. Americans have, we have twice as many Olympic gold medals as any other country. Germany dominated track and field for like three Olympiads and they did jack shit in any Olympic lifting and track and field and swimming, like a handful of sports. Swimming was really there. Really really there. Have stomped most countries. And although I do want to say, America is over. And here's how I, here's why I say that. The US basketball team lost to fucking France. Fucking France. America is over. Well, the, the, the one place I will, I will, it, and this is 100% my own personal, you know, I, I'm bordering on fetish, but <laughs> um, German female shot putters are a species yeah. unto themselves. I don't know what kind of program they've got going, but yeah. they have legions of six foot, wide shouldered, big breasted oh, yeah. maidens that can fucking hurl a put through the air with with a with a level of yeah. fervor that makes my skin tingle. Someone jerked off to asterisk because the kid, didn't they? All right. <laughs> Steve gets that reference. So all right, so back to you. So your training style. So again, for enhanced athletes, like you said, it is because increasing load all the time. And we'll talk about, we'll move to naturals. We'll let me give my side. And I do want to get to nutrition stuff a little bit. We always talk too long, or maybe we'll do that separately. Yeah. Is we know that going way back, right? I remember I used to get into arguments. People were like, oh, nobody really knows what causes muscle growth. I'm like, yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah, we kind of do. Since about the late 70s, Goldspink wrote, there's this seminal paper, The Mechanism of Work-Induced Hypertrophy, where he showed pretty much without fail it was high tension is the initiating factor in growth, right? This was we, because again, we, well, it's, it's the pump and the squeeze and this and that. I'm like, no, it's not, it's tension, period. Now we know why. I read a really tedious article series about this and it's got to do with their, it was funny for years, the biologists were like, how is the mechanical stimulus turning on? And they're like, the fuck if we know. And then the story as I heard it was that the bioengineers came in and said, look, if, if there was a way that the muscle fibers were attached mechanically to the cell wall and the biologists, the physiologists were like, yeah, right. And then they looked and they were like, huh, I'll be goddamned. Because it turns out that there are mechanosensors. There are things like titan and all these whatever and they actually are attached to the cell wall and they actually mechanically pull on shit and there's a mechanic sensor and it turns on i forget the name of it and that's what turns on mTOR and turns on so boom now we have a biological linkage between a mechanical stimulus right and a biological process we know the way the way i the the way i was coached on that um is that it's it's actually Not not so much tension, although that's the kind of easy to use word, but it's actually a geometric deformation. Yeah. Is the trigger. Yeah, and that's and that's you know, when I when I was briefly in grad school, it's because like we used to think of muscle fibers, they were just like line, 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 line. And then but then they found out they're like, nope, every muscle fiber is attached in these little, they're these little connecting proteins that are so when this fiber contracts it'll pull on this fiber even if this fiber isn't contracting and they explain like suddenly all these all these things that were missing in the model of like okay well if this muscle's fiber is damaged how can it still be involved in force production it's because this fiber that isn't damaged is physically pulling on it and it's still so yes and it is that is absolutely the case but is when the fiber generates tension, it causes that mechanical deformation that pulls on something else. And I mean, I've got a paper right here, why exercise builds muscle. Titan, mecha- titan Titan mechanosensing controls skeletal muscle growth under load. So we know that, that tension is the key. There needs to be some level of tension. Now we might mm-hmm. ask, well, how much? This gets into what you talked about with intensity of load. 
50% yep. of max, 20% of max, 60%, 80, 90, 100. Like in premise, working at 100% should give you a higher tension than 85. It actually doesn't work out that way because of a bunch of boring bullshit with recruitment and uh, rate coding that nobody but me and you really care about. But there is a happy medium and we are finding like, okay, yeah, if you do 25% of max and do 35 reps with it, by the end of it, you get sort of the same achieved tension. Net, net aggregate attention. The same sort of end result. It takes yep. you 30 bullshit reps to get there, but whatever, you still get there eventually as doing 85% for a set of five. You've also got the volume issue of if, if there, because yes, tension is key. I remember I got in an argument with someone who was like, tension is all that matters. And I go, look, even for me, that is going too far. Because 100%. if that were the case, all you would need to do, if, if there were not a volume component or a fatigue component or a metabolic work component, one maximal isometric would stimulate growth. And we know that's not the case. Yep. And there's been some work on that, I think by Steele, I forget the specifics, but they kind of looked at that and they were like, yeah, doing, there needs to be a minimum amount volume in your in terminology of work under high tension now now we're now we're looking at the balancing all right if you mm -hmm. want to go at 85 percent of max a five rep max well you're not doing 20 sets right you're not to go well i want to get 100 reps per workout you're not doing that with triples because you're not doing 30 all-out sets of three you can do 10 sets of 10 and be done in the time it would take you to warm up for the triples. Agreed. Five sets of 20 on a shorter rest period, and it'll suck because you'll want to vomit, but you'll get but 100 you reps. And that, and that I think why bodybuilding training per se in the sense of, you know, the hypertrophy zone, that six to 15, that traditional range, you can accumulate a greater total volume per workout much more quickly than doing triples now like yeah you could do 10 sets of five you'll be in the gym all day you'll be exhausted on every level and the heavy loading if your technique is not immaculate you're probably you're gonna get hurt right even even brad's mm -hmm. paper where he compared seven sets of three to three sets of ten or whatever it's like yeah mm -hmm. the growth was the same but two guys the risk factors are not the same a, the seven says the three took three times as long and several guys got hurt. Yep. So it's not a realistic way of getting as much. So yes, to a degree, you need sufficient loading. We don't know how much. But once you've got that sufficient loading, right? So your approach is to bump volume in, right. in conjunction with increasing energy levels. Because, you know, and I know another guy who, who's very, deals with enhanced athletes and he's telling, it's like, yeah, do the volume, just let the drugs do the work. Just go, put, just go put That's in the, the reason water. you're taking the drugs. Fuck. Exactly. <laughs> right. Let the, the question then becomes to flip it over to my side. If you are dealing with naturals or unenhanced athletes or yeah, sub, sub supernatural athlete, whatever naturals, does that change that does that equation change? Now, first, let me sort of, I'll throw out my general beliefs about this. And then I'll qualify those because people tend to mishear what I'm saying because they always do. On the one hand, I do think as a natural, it is more important to get strong in a moderate rep range. I still think that's Dante. I, I, Dante Trudell, I've known him for years. He once said that the key to growth is to get stronger in a moderate repetition range. And I think if anything sums up training, that's it. I might argue what moderate is really, well, but I, 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 like I accept the statement. In that range, I think where we would pretty much agree, like six is on the lower end, you know, probably eight to 15, somewhere in that range. And yeah. I don't, the question that, and, and I don't disagree with that, especially for nationals because, okay, and this is where people get confused. I have never known a big natural bodybuilder who wasn't strong. Agreed. Maybe, were they powerlifter strong? unlikely because they didn't do that training. They didn't do the low rep efficiency technique training. They typically don't lift like power lifters. Sensitization. Right. Is, and, and the way I've put it is because somebody in my group was like, I used Lyle's, you know, 
bench technique and I lost 30 pounds off my he's trying the goal I go well if the goal is hypertrophy do you want to stimulate your muscles or your ego do you want to lift with your brain or with your dick right, right. I go the goal, the goal of power lifting is to lift the heaviest weights with the least effort the goal of bodybuilding is to lift the least weights with the largest with the, with the highest effort Arthur Jones 101 find ways to make exercises harder not heavier Right. And if you look at, I think a lot of those bodybuilding techniques, whether it was non-lock, some of like, do I recommend guillotine bench presses? Absolutely not. It's always, how can we make the muscles work the hardest with the lightest weight on the bar and Correct. for hypertrophy training? And that is the, dis, that is the big distinction. Powerlifting training is about efficiency using the yes. technique to lift the most weight with the least effort versus bot. So the question then, becomes, what was I getting at? Uh, so natural training. Yeah, are they powerlifter strong? No, but more importantly, they got stronger from where they started. Agreed. Right now, yeah, because I because yeah, they're like, oh well, you know, only doing three fifteen for five. I'm like, how many legitimate at let's say a hundred pa- hundred eighty pounds of body weight? How many legitimate three fifteen by five bench presses have you ever seen? It's few. I mean, one hundred percent. It's few. Now, few. Have I seen a bunch of two hundred eighty pound guys do it? Sure. But to see a legitimate three or a legitimate 405 by five rock bottom squat, <laughs> legitimate, I've seen a bunch of half squats and half ass squats or a 500 pound deadlift, legitimate 500 pound deadlift, very rare at lighter body weights. So yes, naturals, I do think have to get stronger in a moderate rep range. But does that mean, to your point, that they need to add weight every workout? No. And that's where people like, there are times like I've written specialization programs and some of my shorter cycles, it's like, yeah, you want to push hard. If you can add weight in good form over a six to eight week span, yes, but you're going to have to back off after that. If you're going to do a longer cycle, it may have to be a much more gradual increase. Yep. One of the things I think Dante is, but you know, Dog Crap was a well thought out program. For people not familiar with it, basically it was an, or a rest pause program, but all, you know, loaded stretching and all that other shit. And it was fine. Mm-hmm. It burned a lot of people out and you had to have certainly that train. You had to be willing to push. You had to be willing to suffer to make it work. I found it orthopedically taxing. Correct. And that is a problem when you start to get very strong is that it yeah. will just tear your ass up, tear your joints up. But one of the things where I think he got everybody back on track is he said, beat the logbook. That the goal is to get stronger over. And yes, he was, but even then he wasn't like add weight every workout, get that extra rep, get that, just try to improve something workout to work. And of course he was cycling exercises, which meant you did never come back to the same movement more than every four workouts, which also made Mm -hmm. a big difference. It wasn't like you were doing a dumbbell bicep curl every workout and trying to improve that one. You would switch to another movement five days later and you would improve that, but it was a different workout. Reminds me, do you know the bigger, faster, stronger system, that old high school, right? Now that was a five by five modified. It was aimed at high school kids, but it was brilliantly set up because on any given day, you could set one of 30 records. You could set a weight record a max record, a volume record, a tonnage record, because on any given day, maybe you're not strong enough to add five pounds, but you're strong enough to get an extra set with that same five pounds. That's a, mm-hmm. And especially for high school kids is a way to keep a bunch of football players in their mm-hmm. busting their, bust their ass because they could always improve somehow. Yep. Even I, I, again, emotional buy-in is a huge Tractor in this entire driven high school kids better than have that than having them max out every workout and getting hurt. You know, to, to your point about you know you getting better at something or adding weight to the bar, getting stronger. Again, I don't even I don't disagree with that in the slightest, even for enhanced athletes. The difference is I take a much more broad view of it and I say you need to get stronger year over year. Right. This yes. time next year, I want to see your five sets of five be right. 20 pounds higher, but I don't care about the ride yeah. linearly from then till now. 
Right. And I think that's where people, that's where they coming out of that HIT mindset. And it's like, okay, if you're a beginner, fine, you're a beginner. Who cares? Everything works in untrained people. Doesn't fucking matter. And even then, my my mentor, who nobody, none of y'all know him, you might, he went to another school in Canada. Nobody's ever heard of him. He was actually a, a materials engineer, but he he taught me how to think more critically because he was a materials engineer rather than an exercise physiologist. And even with beginners, he said, look, add weight once a week, because if you're adding weight every workout, your technique is just going to shit the bed instantaneously. I, I want to interrupt you there and say something. I, as a rule, I don't find Joe Rogan personally <laughs> interesting, um, yeah. but I watch him a lot because I find the guests he get very interesting. Um, Pavel was on his show and it was the worst Pavel interview I've ever seen. I like Pavel. I know him personally. But he yeah. was just utterly disinterested in Joe Rogan. And it was like it was like a cold fish kind of thing. Right. But Pavel went out of his way to mention a, a Russian concept, an Eastern European training concept called step loading, where an athlete would be assigned, you know, uh, you know whatever, like a th- three sets of three or five sets of three in an exercise. Right. And they would literally perform that workout every other day. Okay. With no intentionally, no alteration. Same load, same reps, same everything. And they would do that for a prescribed number of days, take a period off, then begin again at a new step. So they would quantumly add load and then refine. And the idea was exactly that. It was progression needs to be there, but also so does solidification, if you will. And, and so it became this step loading thing. And I, as soon as he said it, I was like, fuck, that appeals to me on a level. Like, I like that. Right. And it's interesting because that's not the first time I've heard that. There's a, a sprint coach named uh, Dan Path, uh, who his stuff, he's interesting. Uh, but one of the things he talks about, he's like, look, when an athlete hits a new PR and realize he's dealing with sprinting track and field athletes, right? Performance athletes. Mm-hmm. And they're... The, the improvements are unpredictable, right? You come in and you don't, it, it's going to happen when it's going to happen. Peaking is lovely. It's a dark art. I've got a, a, another buddy who's a coach who thinks periodization is for sport is complete bullshit, but that's a whole separate thing. Um, he deals with rugby athletes and you can't really peak when you have to play an entire competition schedule. It's neither here nor there. But what passes, look, when a sprinter hits that new level, you should not even push to go faster because you have to, you have now reached a new level of nervous nervous system activation, intramuscular coordination that you need to stabilize at that level and give them a chance to exactly what you just said to solidify. I've had people talk about even when they're strength training, when they make that jump, they're like, I always found that it was better to stay at that new weight for, even if it was just two workouts versus one Mm -hmm. to exactly that, because you are your, it's you, Charlie Francis used to talk about when his sprinters would hit a new PR, they'd be fucking wrecked for a week because suddenly you've hit a new level that is taxing every bodily system. Yep. Um, The Australian track team, this is to show you how so many great coaches in different areas have all observed the same thing. They said, look, when our guys come in and they hit a new hundred meter uh, flying lap speed that they've never hit before, we send them home. Yep. Because what we found is that if we let them PR and PR and PR, we wreck them. We dig such a big hole with that one workout. You've hit such a new, suddenly you have done what your football, high school football coach entreated you. You have given 110% despite the right. physiological impossibility, but you have reached a new level. And now yep. you have to let your body. Uh, Internalize. Again, yeah, to, like, yeah, basically to sort of integrate all of that to this new level. And frequently what I saw when I was speed skating, I would hit a new level. Technically, something would click in and then I would lose it for three weeks. Yep. And then when I got it again, it was locked in. Something yep. about my nervous system had to, I figured it out once and then I would fucking forget how to do it. And then I would come. But yeah, I think there's absolutely something to that. And one thing I've been recommending, like I said, I've got these shorter cycles. I recommend to people, it's like, look, push over four to six weeks because we're specializing because, and that's certainly at an intermediate level because you can get away with it if you're eating enough. Now, when you start to get stronger, advanced intermediate, 
that doesn't work anymore. It grinds your joints down, especially if you're trying to go heavier twice a week or even every fifth day. At that point, maybe we go heavy light. At that point, the same load, the same absolute load on the bar will be a stimulus for a while, right? Because you're not, because it's different. I think conceptually the way it like, okay, let's say, let's say 80% is the minimum intent. We know it's not, but just say, right? If your strength is going up every single week because you're a fairly low level lifter, then suddenly that 80% is falling and you got to keep up with it. But if you're at the point where here's 80% and your strength is coming up, believe it or not, my hand is moving. Yep. That 80% stays 80% for a pretty goddamn long time. Agreed. And, Agreed. You know, and so what I usually tell you, like, look, once you're at a certain point, maybe every fourth week, you know, let's like say you're doing four sets of eight or whatever on an exercise. All right. Two reps in reserve, three reps in reserve, whatever it is. You can do two or three more. It's challenging, but it's not grinding you down. Once a month, go ahead and rep out, assuming you can do it safely. If you get 10, you're fine. Don't change the weight. If you get 12 or more, you're sandbagging it. Add two and a half percent and start again. Because one thing I will add, you mentioned, you know, trying to add a rep. In my experience, people don't realize adding a rep can be just as hard as adding weight right? One rep is worth 3% or thereabout. hundred percent. Could I add that's 3%? Essentially my point. Could, could I add 3% to the bar? Probably not. Well, then you that's probably true. won't. I've also noticed certain movements, especially body weight movements, chins and dips do not lend themselves to adding reps, especially for some people. Some people fucking suck at adding reps. Yep. I had a guy years ago, dude could do chins for fives, hanging the gym off his waist. And I would strip like two, two plus wheels hanging off his waist. And I would take that off for body weight and he'd get like eight. Mm -hmm. Like he just was not built, who knows, fiber type, nervous system, didn't care. We would stay in the five rep range. But it was, even with my power lifter now, she's at the point that add weight, stay there for three weeks. I'll watch bar speed. I'll look at what's going on and go, all right, it's still heavy enough. There's no, mm -hmm. and every time we add weight, it is a, all right, now you need to basically, like you said, with, with Pavel, you need for your body to, for a while, cyclic coaches were talking about absorbing the training, mm -hmm. which I don't yeah. necessarily think means much, but it's the same, like, yeah, we've bumped the weight, it's heavy enough, but we need to wait for that to become, you know, your new baseline or your new everyday weight or whatever you want to talk about it, but that's at that advanced level. So I think we're looking at, beginning level. But yeah, to your point, and I've said this for years, for those who don't want to believe that you need to get stronger over time to get bigger, and the key is over time, then say every workout, then say every week. Go or even gym. linearly. Right, or even Just. linearly. Go to your gym. Look right. at, pick out a random couple of guys and look at what they're benching. Come back in a year. Are they benching the same weight? Yep, they're still in the same size. I don't and care they what else different. they've done. I don't yep. care how much volume or reps or pump or whatever, but yes, it's not that you have to get stronger linearly all the time rapidly. And even so, and, and so my approach is a little bit different than yours. Yours is set the load, modulate the volume. Yep. I, and again, this is coming more from the natural world is mm -hmm. I tend to pick what I consider like optimal volumes, whatever, 15, 16, maybe 20 sets per week, assuming they're within a certain intensity, you know, two, three reps from limits, you know, in that range. And then, well, when you adapt, might be two weeks, might be three weeks, might be a month, add a little bit of weight. Now, I know some people prefer to start at, you know, 10 sets a week per muscle group, which if you actually math it out, right, what do we have? About eight muscle groups, quads, yeah. hamstrings, calves, chest, back, shoulders, <laughs> by, right. 80 sets, boom, right there. And over some time period, bump it up to 20 sets with the same load and then drop it back, add weight. In the big picture, does it matter? Like over, like, and that's, that's kind of it. Like it's great, all these little short-term studies are like, oh, over eight weeks, this was better. Yeah, but over 20 weeks, over a year, over a career, assuming you go from, benching 135 by eight to a, you know, a legitimate 315 by eight, 
how you get there is less important than that you get there over time. On that point, I, I do want to point out one other thing about periodization. And, you know, we're talking about Kirk and Cohn and those guys, you know, Gallagher was the guy behind them that really was the, you know, the, the architect of that. And something that has been lost in conversations about that style of training is how incredibly nominal those programs began. You, you got a guy, Eddie Cohn, who could do a fucking, a fucking 900 pound squat. Right. His 16 week periodization was beginning in the 500s. Right. The people forget those initial three or four weeks of work were arbitrary almost. Right. And that's where I think people fail is one of the reasons periodization fails for them is because they do a test and they figure out 70% of their one RM and they plug it in to this formula. And then they find lo and behold, Oh, I need to deload in four weeks. Well, of course you did because you basically started with your limit abilities and you had no upward mobility. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Unless yeah, there's I, drugs. I, I think a lot of, I think a lot of Cohn's training is desperately misunderstood. Also, you also, if you look at the percentages, the way they were bringing in, suits with straps down and then straps up and then the way the yep. gear it, it tended to really give them a little bit more variety than i think people thought Agreed. um yep. but there, and there's also just there is the numerical issue if you finish the last cycle squatting 950 you're not starting back at 75 percent <laughs> you're, you're just not right yeah. it, it, you, you simply because it will fucking break you right now with my female power lifter again i don't she loses her top end super quickly she forgets how to lift heavy weights like relatively low volume pretty much exclusively singles because that's what works because she's got shitty levers and that's mm -hmm. just what works for her and it's like yeah we get her meat week her meat is her easiest workout in weeks because the way i train and compete her and we start I drop her competition lifts back to 85% of her max. Now that sounds real heavy, but it's a single. Right. One rep at 85% is pretty light. And the systems work, we drop back to 90%. And over 11 weeks, which builds back up every few weeks, I bump it by two and a half percent. But this is a smaller female squatting 225. A big male squatting 900 would fucking die. Yep. That would absolutely kill them to drop back to, you know, only 750 pounds after a meet. They couldn't survive it physically. Correct. They couldn't do it. Um, I think this is not the, the podcast for it. I think I do think there are differences between women and men in this regard, not only do the, the differences in absolute loads. Men are good at intensity and you can use volume as a primary driver. Women are great at volume. And I do think they need relatively higher intensities, especially for something like powerlifting. And the, 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 the tie in to bring all that together is as you bring androgens up in women, you find that their volume intensity responses become ever more male. I, big yeah. surprise. Yeah, a, yeah, big, big surprise. Because again, you are seeing these changes, like you said, in motor learning in, yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so like I said, so I, I think in the big picture, the way you approach training supernatural athletes and the way I typically approach training naturals are not dissimilar. You tend to start with load and build volume. I tend to start with volumes and build load because I do think for naturals, focusing on weight progression is more important, relatively speaking, Mm -hmm. Because you can get big without being strong on enough pharmaceuticals. You Correct. Flat out. You will not get big without getting stronger, at, but it's a matter of degrees. It's a matter of mm -hmm. time frames. It's a matter of, this is a long, like one of my first training partners. And he was a monster. A, he was short like you. And he, he was like 220 in the off season. This is natural. He competed at like 195. Started training when he was in his teens. His dad made, he and his brother, they trained six hours on Sundays. They would alternate one hour on, one hour off, right? And by the time I met him, which was 20 years down the road, 15 years down the road, you know, I watched him squat like 315 by 20, rest pause. He, he could bury 405, high bar, rock bottom, 
pulled five, you know, bench three. He was very, very strong, but he did that over a 15 year time span. Absolutely. And it was, and that's the thing. And it, it is certainly, so yeah, I don't think dissimilar and the differences are microscopic. Right. People, I, I always try to tell people when they get so hung up on what about this system and that system, and the other system, I go, forget about the specifics. If you look at the general, the principles, they're mm-hmm. always the same for all successful systems. It's a matter 100%. of how they're applied. hundred percent. And I think the really the big difference, it literally, if you, if you really press me to like, just blurt out the difference between natural and enhanced training, this would be my response. I think in enhanced training, it makes more sense to anchor load and escalate volume. Whereas in natural training, your recovery abilities never improve because you're yeah. natural. So you anchor volume and you escalate load. Yes, as, as the athlete adapts. And that's really the key. It's not a forcing it. You have to wait for the adaptation to occur. Just right, but you, with, to, to, to make any system work, you must have a framework. Right. You know, it's the yes. Newtonian concept of time and space. You have to have a stage on which to hold your play. Yes. And I believe that the stage for which the drama of enhanced bodybuilding plays out is an escalation of, it's a, a, a flat stage of load and an escalation of volume. Whereas I believe the right. stage or the, the, the presentational aspect of, natural bodybuilding is a fixed volume and an escalation in load. Right. I guess sort of a subtopic you might want to cover. We always go far too long. I hope Zoom doesn't cut out is um, we know now that there are different components of muscle growth. It's really funny watching like now the science, like as much as we like to shit on bro science, and I've certainly done it myself. Yep. Like, yeah, they figured out a lot of this shit on their own and they were right. Right. We yep. like go look at Perilazil stuff, which I still think holds up today. 100%. I love that guy. Right? I I've still got a book on my shelf. Even Vince Garanda, as fucking loopy as he was sometimes, a Maybe lot of that still holds up today. And Perillo, what is the thing? He's like, all right, we need to do some tension work, but we need to do some higher rep work to build the capillary. Capitalization. Right? Capitalization, because we need blood flow. There's now some, you know, we're now finding out through research what the hyper responders are in terms of growth. They have better mitochondrial function. They have better, they have better ability to turn on ribosomes and fucking Duchenne. It's the first one I ever saw talk about activating ribosomes for, for growth work, like, cause he was so 100%. far ahead of his time, but it makes me wonder. And I did another podcast with somebody on this. Is there, what is, what's the trite statement? The best trade, the best training is the one you're not currently doing. Oh, shut up. Right. By that logic, every time you change training, it's no longer best because it's like I realize I'm being I'm playing semantic games, but shut the fuck up. But there does seem to be a certain logic or a certain benefit when people are like, all right, I've done my heavy work. It seems like when I go to pump training. I get a better growth response and then vice versa. Is it possible, whether enhanced or not, are different styles of training developing different components of not only muscle, but also of the muscle growth process. Because we tend to think of it very simplistically. Ah, turn on muscle protein synthesis. No, 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 no. We got steps in a chain. And the weakest link in that chain is what's going to hold you back from growing. Do we need to develop these separately? Do we do sarcoplasmic training to give more room for the myofibrillar training? Do we do metabolic training to develop mitochondrial capacity, energy production, to support growth when we get back into the heavier work, can you develop Once it? Again, all which is, do which, pharmaceuticals do it all at the same time? Well, I, they, pharmaceuticals do do it all at the same time, but I still think there is a grand periodization to this. I do think by moving you periodistically through the calendar, you're able to build layers that coherently layer upon one another by doing very high volume, very low load work. You develop sarcoplasmically and you, uh, uh, capillary wise and et cetera. Then that is a structure that you can move down the assembly line and start applying a load and building architectural density within it. And then you can take that and move it over here and strip off the body fat or do some other thing. 
I, I very much, very much agree with that. Um, and again, it's why I keep coming back to, I believe periodization is an artifact of drug use because all of this in my mind plays on the idea of drug use. But really quick, you mentioned Dan Duchesne and how far ahead he was. Do you remember the, uh, and I know you do because you literally wrote a book about it, but the, the ultimate diet handbook. Oh yeah. And how at the end he That's suggested somewhere. you actually move between high intensity and five by five and high volume um, because of the right. your varying metabolic functions of, of ketogenic dieting. Yes. And that's, and he even said that in the original ultimate diet, he said that the tension workout on Thursday under low carbohydrate status would stimulate, would stress out the ribosomes. So they would increase in activity and be prepared for the power workout as the actual yeah. growth response. And yeah. Turns out he was right. We now know that heavy training does that. And not only does it activate ribosomes, but people, the people who better activate ribosomes are hyper responders to growth. Yep. I think that even ties in with the pharmaceuticals as much as anabolic androgenic steroids are all in the same class. We now know that different compounds are hat like, okay, what Winstrol, I believe separates, increases free test. It separates androgen from SHBG. I forget, I believe one of the steroids specifically increases ribosome activity. Well, to me, this adds logic to stacks somehow being, right? Because in, than- in, in one sense, why should it fucking matter, right? Just take more, just jack in more testosterone, more milligrams, except that empirically stacking compounds, in, and I know you separate into three distinct classes with mm-hmm. different like, okay, so this raises total test, but it, you may get an increase in SHPG. Do we add this to increase, to separate, you know, to disassociate, but do we also add this to increase ribosome activity so that we can get, take advantage of the increased mRNA from et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is it, it wouldn't surprise me if some of the optimal stacks, and I know you don't like the word optimal, of drug users has basically been a way of fi- magically, empirically figuring out how do you target every important step in the pathway to 100%. whatever's limiting is going to be the one that's going to hold you back. The, the, exactly. And that's, you know, that is, and I don't know what this is, this isn't about me nor a, you know, bandwagon thing, but that's kind of my catchphrase is right tool for the right job. Identify the rate limiting factor and then applying the tool that most readily corrects that rate limiting factor, making the whole system work better. Exactly. That's it. That, that's my whole stick. That's and my I, whole I, thing. And I used to always wonder about that with training when people are like, well, I did this and then suddenly I switched and I started growing again. Either, like, and we could get into whatever, fiber typing, nervous system, person, that doesn't really matter. But is it simply that that one style, especially if it's very limited training, if that one style of training was only targeting one, again, we're talking about naturals here, targeting a specific component of growth. Well, now has something been left behind? It, does moving to pump training suddenly increase glycogen storage, energy production? Was, no that was going to be my first thing was fuel storage. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Does this then lend, right? Because it's always so funny. I'm old like you. I've watched every idea come in and out of focus for three decades. And suddenly, what's popular again? Power building. Oh, let's do our five by five and follow it up with some volume work. My favorite approach to this was um, McCallum. In keys to enter progress, you did five by five, you did three warmups, two all out sets of five, and you did eight sets of 10 on a 30 second rest interval. Tension plus volume, that is a winning combination for growth. It always has been. Does it lend some support for Hatfield's old holistic ABC training where we did five by five, 12 by 15s, and then he did sets of 40. My training partner and I, we were nuts. We actually made those time sets. We would do two minutes of straight leg extensions. We were doing low load training way before it was cool. Yep. Was that simply, because again, we look at the principles. Perillo, you did your heavy work and then you did some high rep stuff. Even Garanda was like, all right, you do your tension work and you finish that with burns to get, yep. you don't want to compromise the tension but we want to find a way to get a little more volume and get, who knows, tablites, lactate, mitochondria, energetic stress. Even the, 
original progenitors of like the West Side before it was the Louis Simmons West Side. It was the 1950s heavy light. It was right. basically yes. matching it one day and then doing reps another day. It's yes. never been different. Yeah. It's, I think just then the then question then simply becomes, and there's no, you know, do we do it all at once? Do we do it sequentially? Do we do, cause I, I, cause like, okay, we look at the ultimate diet. You did your, your depletion workouts, 15 to 20, right? We'll call that like, that's essentially low load training, pump, whatever. You did your tension workouts. That was heavy eights. You need your power workout, which is like threes to fives, right? Mm -hmm. Daily undulating periodization came a decade later, and I'm sure Duchesne was like, "Here, hold my beer." Um, yep. Like, yeah, well, we are, we've already done it. Um, yep. Do we then? Do we do it all in the same week? Do we do it all in the same workout? Do we do it? Do maybe do we do two to four weeks of pump training to build that capillary density? We do maybe eight weeks of tension training where we push the loads. Then we finish up with some heavier work. Do we do some? I like doing occasional neural cycles for bodybuilders. Well, you're going to love my answer to that. And I have, a, I literally have a ready-made answer for that. The greater the drug use, the longer you can exploit any one pathway. Fair the enough. less the drug use, the shorter you can exploit any one pathway. If you are literally natural and non-gifted, you probably rotate through that daily. <laughs> if you are somewhat gifted and highly medicated, you can probably do a single modality for eight to 10 weeks. Right. I think especially because you've also got the androgens maintaining. I think that's the other thing we, we forget with naturals. If all you do is pump training for a month and you take all the tension stimulus away, I got news for you. Good you news. are detraining. Yep. Now I've written some stuff and there's an old series on my website where it's like, maybe we do maintenance loads. Maybe you do a couple of heavy sets and then your pump work or maybe once a week or whatever it is. You throw it in a little bit or you just keep the cycle shorter, I think is probably, because I do, I do think for body, for natural bodybuilding, most of the work should be in that, you know, classic zone. Then we sort of top that off. Do a little high rep work for a little bit of this, do a little low rep work. I do still think, believe in bumping maximum strength every once in a while, because mm -hmm. that way you can use heavier loads in higher repetition ranges. Once you, if neural efficiency suddenly becomes limiting, we need to bump that up, not much, maybe three weeks out of every six months, right? It's not like bodybuilders need to be training like powerlifters year round, but you know, every once in a while, do, do some triples, get your neural efficiency way up. And when you go back to sets of six to 15, you're gonna blow, blow your load, sorry, blow loads up way more than you ever imagined. The problem with that and an enhanced athlete is low load, you know, moderate load training develops so much muscle mass that if you then suddenly drop into the five Correct. to three range, you're literally at a structural integrity risk. Right. Which I think is the, that's kind of why I brought up earlier on, you know, for that has always been the issue with steroid use. Everything else gets so much stronger, so much faster. Yep. Connected tissue gives out. You get tendonitis, you get injured because... Which is another, again, not to just hammer it, but that's another reason why I really rely on exploiting volume is right. to avoid that load issue. Well, sort of bringing it, you know, it always, it all comes back to Duchesne. It always comes back to Duchesne. And I remember one of the things he talked about, I think I saw a question about this in, in your group just recently, was like, all right, you know, in the, somebody was asking, if I'm on, should I get, strong in, in eights, 12s, 15s. And Dan's point was like, look, you're going to get big no matter what you do. So you're better off getting big in a higher repetition range, not only for the safety standpoint, because it keeps the absolute loads down, but he was also looking at it. This was back in the day where people actually came off steroids, <laughs> which now PCT is just going to a lower dose. From what I understand, for most people, from what I understand, you just, you move to a maintenance dose. You don't come off anymore. But what he, but what he believed, and I believe this was, because again, now we're looking at that intersection of moving from enhanced to no longer enhanced. The rules have suddenly changed. Yep. And what he believed, and I agree with him completely, was get strong in the 15s. Let's say you finish benching 275 for 15. You're on a hammer incline, whatever. That's never reduce the load. 
He goes, when, if you want to avoid severe muscle loss, when you come off, the worst thing you can do is reduce the load because for a natural, the tension is, is primary. He says now maybe you go from 275 to five. Yeah. He goes, however, if you were doing fives to get big and you were doing 365 for five, well, you can't do that. You're going to have to drop to 275 for five and you're going to shrink. Yep. I, think I really agree with that entirely. Thing, which is a perfect example, I think, of the difference because it does, it looks at what's happening where you're using volume in primary and load secondary when you're enhanced versus load primary and volume secondary. But the comedy is, Lyle, and you've literally just kind of brought this whole argument or whole, whole conversation full circle into a close in that if you do things enhanced now, you do yeah. things my way and you escalate volume, maintaining relatively static or very nominally escalating loads, then during a bridge, whether you come off entirely or you come down to a TRT value, you could act actually add load to the bar right as you decline volume so literally yeah, you will get more tension not less. absolutely no and i agree with that absolutely because that's how i recommended maintenance loading for years and years and years and that's you look at tapering which again also brings it full circle to what they were doing the way they were periodizing around the drugs when you get super strong with in higher volumes when you taper your volumes, as you bring the drugs down or move off or just move to different compounds, not only can you not, not only can you maintain the load, you can go heavier and increase the intensity, which for a performance athlete is exactly what you want. They would just 100%. use volume. Because again, you look at all that old rusky shit, right? And they're like, all right, they, they believed in squatting usually 75 to 80% of max. Just lots and lots and shit loads of fives at 75%. And you look at that and go, what the fuck? How can, now A, they were doing it after the Olympic lifting, but B, over a year of heavy androgen use, yeah, but you can drive your, you can drive your squat up so that when you come off, now you can increase your loads for triples yep. and singles because right. you've gotten, because you've pushed up your, and I, I've written the same thing about endurance training. I was like, how can volume, how can low intensity endurance training make you faster? I go, because if here's your low, indense, low, low intensity speed and here's your max speed, well, you can just hammer it this year round, but guess what? If this is 75% and you push it up to here and it's still 75%, what happens to that when you do the work? 100%. And 100%. More, more safely without burning out, without getting overtrained. Um, so yeah, I think we're pretty much on the same page.